So your bulletins say that uh, we're going to have a message now, and um, Pastor Russell Mullenberg, that's me. Um, so usually when it says that, and that there's a message, and then I come up here on a typical Sunday morning, then, you know, it's 30 minutes at a minimum uh, that I talk, and I understand that you're here today, and you're not here to listen to me, that I'm, I'm merely the warm-up act for the kids that are coming up, so I get that, so, so don't be alarmed, this isn't going to take 30 minutes or anything. I just thought though, um, before we do bring the kids up, that maybe I'd say a word or two about why we do have a children's program and, and why children's ministry is so important to us here at Hope Church. So I've got a psalm. I'd like, uh, I should point this way. I'll, I'll look at that one. You can look at this one. Uh, a psalm that, uh, Psalm 78. Uh, psalm 78 is really a long psalm. It's one of those psalms that tells the history of Israel up to that point, sort of recounts God's uh, faithfulness to the people through Abraham and Moses and, and the Red Sea and David and so on. Um, and this is the introduction to that psalm and kind of explains why the psalmist is going to tell that history. But it also, I think, is, it's, it's good for us today to look at as we think about um, why it is important for us to have our children, have children's ministry within the church. So this is Psalm 78, verses 1 through 7. I'll read it to you. It says, My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we've heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and the wonders He's done. He decreed statutes for Jacob, and He established the law in Israel, which He commanded our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know even the children yet to be born. And they, in turn, would tell their children. And then they would put their trust in God and would not forget His deeds and would keep His commands. So I heard something um, uh, a little while back that when I first heard it, I, I thought, that's kind of scary. And, um, and I, I thought, well, that's not good. That's but then as I thought about it more, I thought, well, okay, I guess, I guess that makes sense. So, so here's what I heard. What I heard was that Christianity is one generation away from extinction. And I heard that, and I thought, well, that's, that's kind of ominous, right? We're, we're one generation away from, from not having people follow Jesus anymore. And I thought, well, that's, wow, that's sort of harsh, you know? But then, I, then as I thought about it, as I reflected on it more, I, I thought, well, I guess it's true of Christianity, but it's really it's true of a lot of things. Um, for example, today is opening day for Major League Baseball. And statistically, if you're under the age of 40, you don't care. Right? That's what they're telling us now. Is that They're telling us that like, the average age of the Major League Baseball viewer is like 56. And, and, and they're saying that the younger generations are not into baseball. They're, they're basketball, football, skateboarding, the X Games, that sort of thing. But, and, and so there's a lot of, if you, I, I watch baseball, so, so I hear this. They, they say if, if, if they don't kind of get the younger generation to care more, there will always be people who like baseball. But they say Major League Baseball is in danger of becoming irrelevant. Right? We're one generation away. If, 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 if the next generation doesn't learn to care about and enjoy baseball and play baseball, then we're, we're, just, we're one generation away from not having baseball anymore. Another example I thought of is, is canning vegetables. All right? My mom cans vegetables. Um, some of you perhaps know this secret art you know, of uh, you grow your own vegetables and, and you put them in a can and, and, and how to seal them and get them to preserve so that six months later you can open up and you, they're still edible, right? Um, some of you know how to do that, but I'm guessing most of us who are younger don't. We get our vegetables at the store, right? And, and, and that's one of those things, of course, that even, you know, two, three generations ago, everybody knew how to do that and had to do that because that's how you preserved your food. But as the generations go by, fewer and fewer people are doing it. And so, so statistically speaking, we've, we've come to the generation that, that canning vegetables doesn't exist for anymore. And so when we talk about Christianity, if, if, if those of us, if we're the generation now, if we're in the generation that, that knows and loves and follows Jesus, if we don't pass that on to the next generation, if the generation that comes after us doesn't learn to love and, and, and follow Jesus, then we're just one generation away 
from Christianity being extinct. And it's always been that way. Um, and so even, even this psalm, you know, the, in, in ancient Israel, they talked about this. You, you, you see kind of the, the process of transmission here, these things that we've heard and known, things our ancestors have told us, we're going to pass that on to our descendants. Right? What, what's been passed on to us from our grandpas and grandmas and our parents, we need to pass on to our children and, 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 and tell them, tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord so that you get down to verse 6 so that the next generation will know and, and, and even the children yet to be born and then they'll teach their, our, we teach our children so our children will teach their children and on and on it goes. It's, this is something, Christianity, the good news of Jesus is something we need to pass on from generation to generation. And so when we come and have a day where we kind of give the day to the children and we bring the children up here and, and, and they do this program that they've been working on uh, for weeks at a time, and when we think about why, why, why is the children's ministry so important at Hope Church, this is why. This is why I, you know, I, I think that children's ministry is one of the, the, the things that, one of the engines that drive our church is that if we don't have a solid vacation Bible school program and we don't have a solid Sunday morning program and we don't have good youth program and we don't, we, you know, the mentoring, if we're not passing on what we know to the next generation, um, then we're, we're being disobedient to this scripture and, 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 and Christianity, our church, is we're one generation away from extinction. It's, it's always been that way. It'll always be that way. But we don't want Christianity to go the way of vegetable canning. And, and, and so we need to tell the children, the children. Um, and, and so it's exciting when the kids come up here and, and they kind of show what they've learned, but then they tell it back to us. And then we hear it from them. And it's like, you know, they're telling. And, and, and we remember what it is, the good news of Jesus that, that um, we need to pass on, that, that it is ours to preserve and to pass on. Um, so why? Why? Really quickly. Verse 6, so the next generation would know. So that's the first thing is because we want our kids to know. We, we want to reach their heads. We want them to know the stories. We want them to know what the Bible teaches. We want them to know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's not just head knowledge. Verse 7, then they'll put their trust in God. So, so we want to speak to their heads, but then we need their hearts too. We, we want them. Our Sunday school programs aren't just about Bible trivia. It's, it's about trusting in Jesus and putting our faith in Him so that, so that they will keep His commands. The last line there. Their hands. So we want their heads, we want their hearts, we want their hands. So that they will follow Him, so that they will serve Him, so that they'll love their neighbors themselves, so that they will tell others about Jesus, so that they will serve the church and the world. And so that's our responsibility um, as parents, as adults, as church members is to tell that next generation to pass that on and to keep that going, to keep that process going from one generation to the next. And so it's exciting to have the kids come up. And we just celebrated Easter last week, and so the kids throughout this Easter season have been working on this program that's going to tell in their way, they're going to tell God's big story in their way, the Easter story, back to us. And so I'm just excited that you're going to be a part of it. So let's, let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Um, Lord, for those who've gone before us, our ancestors, those who've told us about you and have passed on the truth of your word to us. And now, Lord, um, as we teach our children and the next generation, and uh, we pray, Lord, that they too will come to know and trust and serve and obey you, um, that, that the children yet to be born will hear the good news of Jesus and come to love and serve you. And for these kids who are coming up onto the platform now, Lord, we just pray blessing on them. We thank you for the work that they've done to share this program with us. And we pray, Lord, that now you would calm their hearts and minds, that you calm their nerves, so that all that the practice and preparation they've done will show forth um, in this program. In your name we pray. Amen.
the bunny, the real true story of Easter. Well, I like the big Jesus parade I just watched, but I'm still not sure why all this should matter to me. Maybe if I watch a little more. Did you hear what that kid just said? She's not sure why all this should matter to me. Yeah, that was just, well, kind of weird. She just needs to focus a little more on what we're doing here. I'm sure it was nothing personal. Hey, kid. I'm in here, in your TV. Yeah, I'm talking to him. You're talking to me? You can see me? Well, of course we can see you. You can see us, can't you? Uh, yeah. Come closer. That's it. Closer, Just closer. Lean in. Just lean in here. We want to show you something. Ah! Where am I? Who are all you guys? We are your new best friends. Am I dreaming? How did I get here? We're here to help you. You are? Of course. We heard you say why you don't think Jesus should matter to you. Well, each one of us met Jesus. In fact, we know him pretty well. Right. Take me for instance. Hi, my name is Jonathan. You may not realize it, but you already know my story. I do? How? Does the phrase five loaves and two fish sound familiar? You serious? Serious as the high priest at Passover. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that after that day. Jesus and I were pretty tight. Don't get so carried away there, lunch boy. We're all his friends. Okay, okay. So he loved every one of us, and we all loved him.
think I get it. You were all friends with Jesus, but how did you all know each other? At first we didn't. We came from different towns and had different backgrounds. But it is natural for our people to visit each because the time is chosen and chosen. Definitely a time to be in Jerusalem. We'd all come here with our parents for the sacrifices and meals. But after a while, a kid just has to escape. We all ended up hanging near the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where we started telling our stories. We talked about Jesus and just how great he was. There's no one like him. Jesus in my life and saved my whole world on the same day. I was one sick kid. What was wrong with you? Uh, demons. Flea bombs? No, no, he was possessed. He had a pest? <gasps> he was, he was. I was demon possessed. Wow, that's, that's. Crazy, wicked, yeah, I know. The demons tormented me day and night. Finally, my dad went to Jesus and, a, and the, the, Jesus and asked for help. The next thing I know, Jesus drives the demons out, and I'm completely normal. Or as normal as Gideon's ever going to be, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny, but I don't know what I would have done without Jesus. I heard that when Jesus came to be baptized, John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We understood the importance of the Lamb because they were sacrificed for our sins. So to think that John saw Jesus as the Lamb of God, it was like he knew he would be sacrificed for us. are amazing. I mean, they're, they're... 
Miraculous? Exactly. My story isn't exactly a miracle. My parents just wanted Jesus to bless me, but his disciples said that Jesus had more important things to do. Then Jesus picked me up and said no one should ever keep a child from coming to him. The best part was when Jesus said his kingdom would be made of people who believed and trusted just the way a little child does. That's how he wanted it then, and that's how he still wants it now. He wants people to trust him, like a child. So you're saying that that's what Jesus wants from me too? He wants me to trust him? Now you're catching on. Trust him with what? And for what? I still don't see how all this matters. I know it doesn't make a lot of sense right now, though a lot of people love Jesus. The religious leader saw him as a big problem. He made them look really bad, and they were afraid of losing their powers. But. Right.
procession? Kind of like the parade on the Sunday before, only this time nobody sing his praises. Were any of the rest of you there? Almost everyone deserted Jesus that day. What makes it worse is that he went to the cross, not because he had to, but, he want, but because he wanted to, so that he could save us. That includes you too, Annie.
I wasn't there that day, but after hearing the story this way, it's almost like I was there. I feel so sorry for the things I've done that made Jesus have to die on the cross. But why would he do that? Now, fear, the reason doesn't matter. What matters is, when you mess up, Jesus forgives you. So whatever I've done, Jesus wants to forgive you for it. That's why the story matters so much. And he wants you to use your life and whatever he's giving you to help others. Jesus wants you to know that he has the power to help you through anything, and he wants to help you. And that's why the story matters so much to you today. But what about you? I know everybody's story but yours. Oh, I think mine's the best. Well, you see, Annie, I, well, I died. When I was really sick, my dad went to Jesus to ask him to come and heal me. But then people went to him and told them, told them that it was too late. I had already died. Then Jesus came into my house and took me by the hand and brought me back to life. No way. Way. Jesus even has the power over death. He proved it with me and others. Best of all, he proved it after his death on the cross. He was buried, and on Sunday morning, he came out of the grave alive. Now we have his promise that we can trust him and live with him forever. happen in the story of why Easter really matters. Beyond the bunny? What, what, what bunny? Right, just forget I said anything. I get the whole thing now. I just have one more question. 
How do I get back home? Huh? Hey, no problem. One, One two, two, three. We. All right. Let her ride. Everybody needs to see this story, or at least hear it. Maybe that starts with me. The real, true, amazing story of Easter is just as important here and now as it was 2,000 years ago. Jesus came and lived and died, and then he rose again. When we believe that story, and when we give him our lives and follow him, he changes everything. We're alive forever, and it's all because of Jesus. If you believe that story, and if you owe everything to Jesus, why don't you stand and sing it with all of us? guys. They were amazing. Let's give them another big hand. <laughs> we do appreciate you guys coming today. Um, when we do our spring musical, we really talk a lot with the kids about um, the opportunity to be up here. And we know that Pastor Russell doesn't give up his pulpit very often. And so we we realize it's a privilege and a responsibility. So this group has chosen to work really hard because we like to tell God's big story our style. So we appreciate you guys coming today. We thank you for sharing your kids with us. Mary Van Drunen led the music this year, and Sarah Kearns led the actors, and it was just so much fun. So they worked really hard. So let's give them one big hand. Thank you guys for coming.